We are here. I'm here with Rodney and uh, yeah. Sanyi from One Shot. And um, today we're going to be doing a taste test in the spirit of Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving just passed. And the best side is macaroni and cheese, I believe. In your opinion. I don't, I didn't ask for any other opinions. No, I really is. You guys are welcome. Mac and cheese. Never lie. Anyway, mac and cheese is the best side. And that's what we have today to taste test. I already have some thoughts about it, but I'm just going to save those for the actual taste test. (laughs) What are your thoughts? Well, you got to size it up with the look, right? Well, so you I gotta think that look one at is it. vegan. If it's ashy, and for those who don't know, because some of my, my white friends in Canada, when I used to say ashy, they didn't, had no idea of what I was talking about. See, ashy is what is, is when it looks dry. So if your mac and cheese has a dry consistency, you know, you might need a little, a little more butter. A little crusty, musty. A little more oil. So I see a little dryness going on, but we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, uh, let's, Yvette, let's it get over. into it. Let's do it. So they are still eating. Um, clearly, look at Rodney. He just finished sure. the plate. We gotta make sure it's got all the. You forgot a. You forgot a couple. <laughs> Somebody give him a spoon. That's what he needs. Um, thoughts on the first mac and cheese? I think it's vegan just from looking at it, but also tasting it. The cheese did not taste like real cheese. You know, cheese like has. I'm. I love cheese, so I would know. But cheese is like really stringy, right? And it kind of like melts in your mouth when it's melted. Um, this cheese kind of was just there. All right, now now listen to me. Uh, as you can see, I'm a, uh, whoever made this, I just want you to know there's no beef. It's gone, right? Uh, it was good. It was, it was okay. Uh, I will say this. Definitely, uh, definitely the presentation wasn't the greatest, right? There was no, there was nothing that made me just want my mouth to water. Uh, amen. It was kind of bland. It was kind of dry looking. Uh, the taste, however, it was all right. Yeah, same thing. I, I will preface it by saying I know the idea of don't judge a book by its cover. But uh, if y'all know the book Kama Sutra, the cover. <laughs> I'm playing. I'm playing. Cut that Kama Sutra. Out. Isn't that. <laughs> Isn't that sex? What are you talking about, man? Hold on, man. Hey, listen. He just started with what? Sh- <laughs> he just started yesterday. <laughs> you ain't married, boy. I know. That means you know. Shayla's face just I know. <laughs> Look. Get on my plate. <laughs> nasty self. <laughs> No, no, my, my real take is that um, no, don't judge a book by its cover. But don't touch it with the fork if you ain't gonna eat it. No, nah, I'm a, I, <laughs> I right, go ahead, bro. I think it's it's a little on the on the bland side, uh, but <laughs> the cheese is kind of like crackly. Look at my boy on my plate, though. Like <laughs> you vulture, but um. Yeah, nah, it's a little on the like flaky. Bl- I don't like that. I like my mac and cheese to be like moist. All right, part two, let's go. Um, okay, so this one I think is the homemade, not vegan mac and cheese. I have high expectations for it. Um, I will say I have seen mac and cheese that looks like this presented very well, and then it just falls flat. So you know, I see some spices in there, so I'm I'm very optimistic. Now that's got a different. <laughs> that's got a different vibe. Yeah. That's a different cheese. What is that? Yeah, what kind of cheese is this? What is that? <laughs> uh, feta? What is that? Maybe like blue cheese. Huh? Blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's giving like blue cheese. That's right? exactly what it is. <laughs> Blue cheese. Somebody need to tone down the creating. <laughs> you, that, that's not the time to be experimenting, man. I know this taste. When you in the kitchen for Thanksgiving, you gotta come with the regular, the regular playbook. You can't be off brand and off script now. This ain't the time to run trick plays and punt plays and 
letting the quarter the, the, the quarterback be wide receiver. You gotta stick to the playbook. That was strange. <laughs> I think I might have to switch my switch what's going on here. Yo. What? Yeah, bro. I don't know. That had a weird little it's like a it's like a man, I don't know. It had a very sensual look at it, right? Very sensual to look at it. Then once you just see that, that'll preach right there. Some things, amen, in life will look good on the outside, look very tempting and pleasurable. Like the world's culture. Like the world's culture. But you taste that mug and your breath going to be smelling like blue cheese and Gouda. It had to be blue cheese. I don't know what that was. There's no way that it wasn't. Notice where my fork is, y'all. I'm not diving in for seconds. You know how you wanted that to be good like I really so did. bad. So good. Ooh, I wanted it to be preach. so preach. You wanted that relationship to be so good. Come on somebody. Amen. Like, you wanted it to work. Why didn't you just use cheddar cheese? Like I don't understand. Sharp cheddar is still a thing. Listen, we're going we're going to end this taste testing with this this sermon right here. Not everything that looks good is actually going to be good. So you might have some 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 relationships, you may have some things going on. It looks good. It looks like that moist mac and cheese, but then it hits you with that 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 um undesirable taste. Amen. Y'all y'all like, I hear that. No, I, I felt like that. I felt Kerosene. violated by that. Kerosene. So can I didn't know which experience one? that. Tastes like which one was which? I didn't want to experience. I'm still tasting that taste. Yeah, I, I it's on the back of my tongue. How did they thought that was fun? It's like when you eat onions and then your I breath stop, just no. smells like onions for the rest of the time. I don't know. Who That's made what that cheese that. like. Who made that, Shun? Shun, I need to know Smash. because I Can don't we want know, somebody please? thinking that I just made fun of their heart. Listen, if you made this mac and cheese, please don't be offended by Rodney or One Shot Church. Um... I love your food. No animals were hurt. <laughs> no animals were harmed in the making of this video. What's going on, One Shot friends and family? How you guys doing? It's Rodney, and uh, I'm joined with some special guests this morning, or whenever you are watching this. Uh, why don't we swing it this way? Introduce myself. Yeah. Hi, friends. My name is Yvette. Um, I'm a servant leader slash worship leader at One Shot. Oh, That's she is today. so funny with the like. All right, I'm gonna swing it this way. What's up, everybody? I am Sunny. I'm also a servant leader at One Shot, and uh, yeah, that's it. That's cool, all I got for you. Ooh, cool. We appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you guys being here. Uh, man, it's it's a it's a it's a uh, one of my favorite weeks. At the time of us recording this, we are in the Thanksgiving season, and uh, to be honest with you, this is one of my favorite um, holidays. But uh, at the same time, this is this is probably going to be a tougher season for a lot of folks, especially as we're experiencing COVID-19. So um, I want you guys to know that we are thinking about you, especially there are certain states that have travel bans and uh, loved ones won't be able to connect. And uh, especially our elderly, they may not be able to connect with family members and, um, and friends. So we're thinking about you guys. We're praying for you. And uh, we want to start this conversation off uh around Thanksgiving and and what it means to give thanks. But at the same time, we're going to move in and we're going to start talking about culture and the current climate of our culture um, and also what Christ has to speak into, what Christ has to say uh, about culture and, and how we as believers should interact with him and uh, interact and live in, the, in this world. So let's start off with that question. Um, Sonny, my brother Sonny, as it pertains to uh, your life, as it pertains to who you know God to be, what are you most thankful for? I am thankful for um, him being willing to commune with me. Mm -hmm. Just his uh, desire to be closer to me and in that, I see it in so many ways as a proxy because everybody is thankful for their their family, their friends. And, and in the same way, the reason we're thankful for them, the reason I'm thankful for my family, my friends, my community is because these are people that are close to me. These are people that want to be close to me. These are people that mm -hmm. want to hear my heart, want to hear what is, when I'm down, when I'm happy, when I'm sad. And that is who Jesus is, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, that is the framework of 
the way that he loves me. So when I say like I'm thankful for why being able to commune with my father, with my creator and his willingness to be closer to me, his desire to be closer to me. So like I see that in my life. I see that as a proxy, like I said, through my friends and my family and my community, my church. But in the same way, like that is who Christ is. That he is the one that draws closer to me. He's the one that reaches He's down. He's the fullness and the combination of all of yeah. that acceptance and 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 wanting you. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I think that's uh uh I think that's I think that's powerful. Um one of the things that stuck out to me as you were talking was the fact that Jesus was the one who initiated this. Absolutely. You know, the um the 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 commune as you said, you know, um but Jesus is the one that said, I want you and and I'm going to go be the bridge to get after you. So, wow, that is a powerful thought. And even hearing you um, explain that just makes me more grateful. Miss Yvette, how about you? Um, I think the biggest thing that I'm thankful for in my relationship with Jesus would be the fact that he doesn't rush me. Mm. Um, I think sometimes I can just take a really long time to kind of get things. And I feel like in my relationship with Jesus, he's not like, come on, like you just need to get this. It's like, he's willing to sit with me for however long it takes to kind of get to that next phase or not even, it's not even really about like getting to the next phase, but like learning the lesson within whatever I'm going through. So I think that's what I'm mostly grateful for. Yeah, man. Oh, wow, man. Just to, that's, that's good. That's why it's so good to express gratitude because in, in my opinion, gratitude is, is contagious. You know, um, when you get around people who are grateful, they rub off on you. You know, um, that, that, that's a big quality that we try to emphasize in our house. Um, and, and as a husband to my wife, Shayla, I'm consciously, even last night, you know, I'm always trying to get my kids to say to see why they should be grateful for their mother and what their mother does. And, and, and I'm noticing that now it's becoming their habit of acknowledging and being verbal with what they're grateful for. I think that's a powerful attribute. And I love that. God doesn't rush you like he's patient with us. Wow. You know, and and that makes me think about having children because I don't have all the patience in the world for my kids, my brother. Amen. Um, They are my offspring. So there is a level of like, I have to do this. I have to be patient with you. But to think that we are God's offspring, you know, we have been born into the family, adopted into the family of God. And he views us as his children. We are his children and he's patient with his children. As we learn and as we stumble and fall, as it takes us forever to get certain things, like my son still puts Nathaniel, stretch your hands to Nathaniel right now in Jesus' we name. We love you, Nate. We, we, we just love you, lift man. you up. Don't listen to him. But uh, he puts, he consistently puts his shoes on the wrong feet and wears his clothes inside out. I'm just like, how do you consistently do this, my brother? Consistently. Amen. What are you doing? Yeah, he knows what he's doing. Now, that's that's powerful. But anyway, Rodney, come on, stay focused, right? Pray, stretch your hands to me, amen. Uh, but uh, one of the things I'm grateful for, um, I, not to sound so cliche, but I am thankful uh, for the cross. I am thankful for what the cross means to me. Uh, for me, when I think about Jesus dying for me, it isn't just the one minute you know, gospel spill. Um, Jesus died for my sins and, you know, and he died for me so I could live with him. But it's, it's the fact that Jesus, you loved me so much, uh, that you refused to leave me in the condition that I was in. And you chose to literally take upon yourself what my condition, the consequences, the judgment, the condemnation, the shame, my, uh, sin deserved. You took it upon yourself and you did something for me that I couldn't do for myself. So for me, the cross is a monument um, that I can look back to for God's love for me every day. You know, when 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 I'm feeling down, my God, when I think about the cross, it's hard for me to stay there. Uh, to know that the cross has given me life, the cross has given my life meaning, has given me purpose, has given me value. I'm valuable to God enough. You know, uh, my value to God looks like the cross. You know, God's love for me looks like the cross. God's uh, initiate, initiation of relationship to me looks like the cross. It's powerful. God's patience, you know, to me looks like the cross. So I am thankful um, for the life of Jesus Christ and the fact that he gave his life for me. 
um, and he defeated and conquered death. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Right? So uh, just to say this about gratitude, man, gratitude really is a heart condition. And um, I think in this season, as we and our world is experiencing um, the, the, the ramifications and the effects of COVID-19 and this global pandemic, as they're saying, um, and even as people are being laid off from their jobs and uh, there's food lines all over our country, people are starving all over the world, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's almost a shame for us uh, to be complaining. It's almost a shame for us to not think about those people and, and not appreciate what we have and where we are. I'm thankful that um, I can still see family members and um, interact with them. I'm thankful I can still provide for my family. I have a job where many people are being laid off. We all have things about our lives that we don't like, right, Miss Yvette? Not to put you out there. I feel I'm in the same boat as her, but <laughs> explaining about your job situation. Man. Oh, you want me to explain? No, I'm just saying. Oh, but you, yes, the, yes, I co signed everything you just said. The, the way um. she was feeling about her job. like, But <laughs> it puts you back into remembrance. Hey, man, but thank God I have a job. Yeah. Thank God, literally, I can pay my bills. I can keep a roof over my head. I can feed my family. There's a lot of men and women all over the world that cannot do that. So um, praise God for that. So gratitude really has to do with our hearts and the condition of our heart. And a point that I just want to leave you guys with about gratitude is it is contagious. So practice gratitude because guess what? Other people, it will rub off on other people and it will help lift everyone's hearts, everyone's spirits, especially as we're in a joyous time, a, th a time of thanksgiving, but yet for many people, a time of great sorrow. So we are thinking about you. We are not ignorant to that. Um, let's get the conversation rolling. We're going to switch gears a little bit about Christ over culture. We're, we're in this series and, and we're talking about um, the, the influence of culture, the power of culture, and just uh, the depravity that we see in the midst of our culture right now. Um, we see political division in our culture. We see moral depravity all around us. Um, there's so many different things that are happening in our culture. And we realize as believers, hey, Christ has something to say. As outcasts, y'all y'all might be too young for that, but when outcasts got up on stage, they said the South got something to say. For all y'all who don't know about Outcast, I pray for you. Amen. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, playing. I'm playing. I'm playing. But uh, no anyway, I'm gonna get off of that. <laughs> People no be cap. like, yeah. anyway, Rodney. <laughs> so the first question I want to throw out uh, to you guys is this: It is what is culture, and why is it so powerful? Hmm. Who wants to jump at that first? Ladies first. Ladies. Ladies, okay. Sounds like you got something to say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I always got something to say. Ethiopia got something to say. You know, you know. So, Oromo. Oromo. Oromo yeah. So And Amaric. Uh, yeah. All we gonna, we, we're praying yeah, for unity. Everybody, amen. Yeah, Come amen. On. So, um, <laughs> yo. Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, culture for me is like seeing what you like. What You explained it in your sermon a, a couple weeks back where it's like uh, our behaviors uh, what we create, you know, and for me, one thing that was like poignant for me is like uh, how you attach yourself to the world, how you see the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, culture is something that is overlooked so much because we think we are so individualistic to an uh, extreme extent. Like, I feel like everybody wants to be like, oh, no, no, I'm paving my own path. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I thought about is as we were going through the sermon series is like, um, you know, the the Bible talks about how uh, the way of the righteous is narrow. Right? Come on. But this like, Bible, yeah, come on. You know what I'm saying? But, uh, but the way of the <laughs> righteous is narrow, but the way of the world is broad. You feel mm. me? And so I feel like even if you are making your individual avenue uh, in the world, it is that. It's a part of the trillions or whatever paths that you can take you still may be a part of a collective collective yeah. and you are there's a there's an end goal there's a place mm -hmm. where that's going to take you and it's collective not a collective thought collective thought collective, collective behavior yeah, collective yeah. creation mm -hmm. all of that what mm -hmm. you attach yourself to yeah. but that one narrow path is completely and utterly associated with attaching yourself to Christ mm. And so, like, that distinction of what is Christ, what is culture, if you're like, man, I don't believe I'm a part of a world culture, 
look at the end, right? If you look at the end, you'll see clearly where you have been attaching yourself to. You're either attaching yourself to Christ or you're attaching to yourself to the world. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, that trillion avenue like lane that you're on, whatever, and you have your one lane and you're going down and you're attached to the world, then it's going to bear the fruits of being attached to the world. Mm -hmm. Versus if you that narrow path is you attaching yourself to Christ. So that's kind of like the distinction that I've been thinking and, about. And not to, you know, put words in your mouth, but that's what makes culture powerful. Yes. It's like culture, uh, we talked about this a little bit, and uh, the, the sermon was actually called um, For the Culture, For the Culture. But we talked about there's a current to culture. Like, if you're not careful, like in a stream or in the ocean, I've been at the beach where you're playing in the ocean or whatnot, and then you think that you're still in front of where your beach towel and, and your umbrella is, but when you look up, you're way down here. You're like, how in the world did I get all the way down here? It was the current. The current kind of carried you uh, away from where you thought you were originally at. So, so culture is kind of like that. If you're not intentional about understanding culture, culture may actually, by its current, carry you somewhere else. Yvette, what's your thoughts? I was going to say that's a really good analogy, um, the current with mm -hmm. culture. Um, I was going to say I think culture comes from your belief system. Mm. Um, and then if I feel like if we look at culture, it's like you can't get away from culture. It kind of bleeds into like your everyday, like from, I feel like it can be generalized, right? Maybe um, there's like a culture in your town or uh, you know, at your college, whatever, but then there's also culture. Um, like the things that you, I guess, do every single day, um, the belief system that you have, I think a lot of the things that you do stem from that. Oh, man, that's awesome. So uh, so here's the deal. Um, I think it's safe to say this. Culture, although it's ambiguous, right, um, it's everywhere, it's it's a part of our lives. It's a part of our families. It's a, it's it's a part of where we our environments, where we've grown up, our country, our state, our world. Culture is kind of constantly moving, and it and it ha it takes on this ambiguous form. But yet, it it's 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 very much tangible. It very much has an effect on our belief systems, as you said, Miss Yvette. Culture has uh, a lot to do with our belief systems, and it shapes how we think. Um, it shapes how we behave, and it also shapes what we produce as as a community, what we produce as in individuals, what we what we produce as a nation. And uh, right now, we're experiencing uh, so much political division. Um, I have friends that are on the on the far right. I have friends, uh, obviously. Uh, being an African American and a minority, I have friends and family that are on the far left, and and I see how people lean in so intentionally, and in how culture has swept people away. I'm not saying that I'm better than anyone. I do get caught up um, in, in the in the in the hurrah and in at times, or it's it's easy to feel like you need to choose a side. But like the scripture we talked about in uh, the sermon for the culture. Paul said in Colossians chapter three, set your mind on things above. It's almost like you see Paul trying to push our mind, push our belief systems above what's here on this earth, because he's saying, yo, that's reality. That's where your home is. That's where the end is. Not down here. But we can go to war and hurt one another and fight one another and argue with one another right down here um, as it pertains to this earthly culture and actually reject all the while our heavenly culture, which is really where our home is and our hearts are. I want to ask you guys this question. Why do Christians specifically, why do Christians seem to follow culture more than Christ? I, I think um, one thing that's important to look at is um, the struggle that there is um, especially in knowing the truth, but still struggling with our, like, the fact that we're still humans, you know? And I think that, not I think, I know that the Bible doesn't even overlook that. If you look at um, the the verse in Colossians that you just talked about, set your minds on things that are above. Um, even um, if you look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2, uh, be transformed, right? Um there's a transformation. There's a metamorphosis. There's a 
there's an action to set your mind on something that is above. There's an action that is necessary. So it shows you, like, that it doesn't discount the fact that we're humans. We struggle, you know? And a lot of times, I think the culture, uh, shameless plug, the culture um, that is set up in the church itself is you're either perfect or get out of here. And so the fear of being imperfect, the fear of struggling with these things, which is not true. It's not a it's not a valid it's not a valid uh statement that you have to be perfect because nobody can be perfect. But in our minds we're like, yo, I can't be struggling with this. I can't be struggling with my political beliefs. I can't be struggling with uh the things that the world has to offer for me. So I you know what? I I just rather just step away from it. And then there's a fear that's created. There is a distance that's created between being um, what you have been transformed to be and what your human, what your carnal self, right? And so, like, for me, one thing that I had to get over personally was the fact that I'm never going to be perfect, right? I'm never going to be perfect. And there's going to be a struggle, but that struggle is, like, right in the right place to be as long as your intention, your mind is set on uh, Christ, and that's kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, where it's like you either intentionally uh, or unintentionally, where that whole idea of being lukewarm, you can unintentionally or intentionally be at- attached to the world. But me intentionally being attached to Jesus looks like me constantly letting him transform me, letting him put me through a metamorphosis so I can become uh, what he has created me to be. Right. So essentially you're saying like, you know, one of the reasons why Christians are struggling specifically with being swept in with the current of culture um, or outright deliberately like, you know, fighting for a culture that is anti culture of heaven is because there's this tension of in this. I almost hear you saying like there's this tug of war between earthly culture, heavenly culture. Yeah. You know, and because we're human and we can see, touch, feel, taste, smell, we tend to allow the earthly culture to overpower overpower and overshadow the heavenly culture. Yeah, yeah. Right? And if we're not intentionally um, focused on the heavenly culture, which is where Christ is, Paul said, Colossians chapter 3, where Christ, set, your, set your mind on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father, where your real life is, right? If we're not intentionally doing that, We'll probably lose the battle in that tug of war, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I, that's that, that's what I was hearing you saying, Miss Yvette. What do you think? I was just gonna add. I think um, it's also easier um, to kind of be in the world's culture mm, why you than that? to because I feel like as soon as you have a stance on an issue, um, here comes persecution, right? So it's just like, mm. okay, so do I either speak up and say what I believe or do is it easier for me to just be quiet on this issue be quiet on this topic I feel like there are a lot of topics in general that Christians don't speak about because it's just like what we are don't, some of those topics you think? um one of the things that we were talking about last week like abortion yeah you know I feel like it's easier to just be like okay let me just be quiet and not say yeah. anything um and not speak truth um because it is such a it's such a delicate issue yeah it's not necessarily a uh it is a black and white issue and then again it's and then again it, it isn't you know yeah but i hear i hear exactly it's, what you're saying yeah they're, they're these issues are not black and white so i think a lot of times it's like it would be easier if there was just like a a guidebook on how to how yeah. to approach certain um topics and and speak about them but i think that's one of the reasons it's easier to just hide you know yeah, I think that's a I think that's an excellent point about persecution because um you know, quite frankly, like what we talked about, obviously uh you know, there's the earthly culture which has been corrupted by sin. We talked about this uh last week. Um there's an you know, it's been corrupted by sin because Satan um or the devil is the god of this world or the ruler of this world he is the dominant influencer as it pertains to earthly culture but then when we look at um the the culture of heaven which is what Christ came to usher in obviously 
this culture is countercultural to the to 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 the Earth's culture, uh, whereas the Earth's culture, where uh, Jesus says, um, I can't remember the uh, chapter and verse, but where he's telling the disciples, he's saying, you know how the Gentiles do, you know, uh, you know how they deal with authority. They 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 rule or lord it over you. But he says, but it, it shouldn't be that way with you. Hold on. And they're like, what are you talking about? He's saying, actually, in my kingdom, those that have the greatest authority, those have that have the greatest responsibility are actually the least. They make themselves servants of all. Whereas in, in the earth, everyone's fighting to get to the top so you can be the shot caller. You can be the person that answers to no one. You can be the person that just tells everybody what to do because why? You're in charge, right? So we see heaven's culture is countercultural to the earth. And if that's the case, you're going to suffer persecution to some degree because you're following, you're believing, you are, you are uh, uh, propagating a culture that is not normal here on earth, right? Compassion, empathy, we all love these attributes, but is that what's normal? Is that what's, uh, uh, what we see reflected in our society? No, which is why Christians get put in such weird predicaments, especially politically, because we don't fit in either category. Right. You know, and we want to be the people want to force me into one side and say, no, 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 you're a Republican. But then, you know, they you know, the Republicans may want to force me into the Democratic Party because of we don't fit here. This is why I think our systems and our world systems, we shouldn't follow because at some point they're going to fail us. We should not fit, I think. If you fit comfortably in either one of these categories, you might want to do some inventory on your heart because I don't think Jesus would fit comfortably in any one of these categories. What are y'all thoughts? Anything to add on that before we move on to the next question? I was just going to say um, the election in general has just brought me um, to a very overwhelming state to the point where I was just like, you know what, forget this. Um, and I think on both sides, um, there are things that it's just, it's just stressful, um, policies and, and I lost my words, but I'm just going to keep going. Um, keep going, sorry. it's, it's hard. I think like, kind of like what you were saying about, um, Republicans versus Democrats. It's like, you see, I have TikTok. So on TikTok, right, like you see a lot of like these Christians that are Republicans and I'm just like, okay, cool. Like if you want to be a Republican, go off. Like, you know, nobody's stopping you, but it's just like, but then they're saying like, oh, well, like you're not a Christian if you're not Republican. And I'm just like, let me go to my Bible because I don't, I don't think that's <laughs> right, like anywhere, right. you know? So um, I feel like even Christians are trying to push um, certain beliefs onto each other that are not biblical. I'm just mm. like, I don't fit. Kind of mm. like how you were saying. Mm. I w it's something you just said that, that that's powerful, Yvette. Like, um, and I think it can, it can really just go unnoticed, but I want to bring people's attention to what you just said. You said, I don't see that in my Bible. And so I think that, you know, number one, Christians we should be living a biblical, a biblically based life. And I know especially um, the, the, the stereotype is, you know, young people uh, don't, they, you know, they don't really care about understanding the Bible or they don't really know the Bible. And, and I think a lot of young people do want to understand theology, but what you just said is powerful. And I don't want to move past that really quickly, but uh, I want you to talk to me real quick about the influence of theology in your life that's caused you um, to to live a certain way, which which has really produced health in your life. I think on the most basic level, it's been like it's redefined my relationship with Christ. Mm. Um, just from understanding that like God died for me and loves me, and like through faith I'm saved. Like. Just learning that and knowing that, I was just like, wait, like this is not, this doesn't sound like anything that I've learned in church. This doesn't sound like anything that I've learned, um, you know, from the other Christians around me. So I feel like kind of being here at One Shot and just like learning more about um, 
theology and like learning about why it's important to understand what's in your Bible, it's it's made my relationship with Christ like a lot more. Okay, I have those like aha moments where I'm just like, this makes sense. Like there are layers, but like as soon as you start to understand what you're reading, as soon as you start to, okay, well, you know, why am I, why is this sentence important? Like things like that. It's just like, okay, you bring more perspective into what you're reading and you're just like this I understand a lot more now, you know. That's good. Did you feel like it didn't? Did, did you feel like approaching the Bible is just something that maybe pastors or theologians can understand? And and maybe did you feel like I'll never really be able to understand this? I'm gonna try, but I don't think I'm gonna really be able to understand this. Yeah, it was something that I I didn't think I would be able to understand, and then also I didn't really want to mm. because it just seemed like hard and unattainable, wow. and so it also made. A relationship with Jesus like I didn't even know like it was more I didn't know I knew but I didn't know that relationship was like the basis of Christianity um so after even learning that I was just like oh like okay um but yeah it it, it definitely made me like learning that it was it was interesting because it wasn't just like you need to read your Bible and now you need to learn theology. It was like, no, like focus on Jesus. And then as soon as you're focusing on Jesus, like these things are revealed through community or through reading your Bible or going to a church that is theologically sound. So, yeah. Holla. I'm going to ask her one more question and I'm going to come 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 to Mr. Sonny. So theology has shaped primarily your view and your understanding of Christ and who you are in Christ has understanding theology impacted the way you treat or view other people? <laughs> um, yes. Um, it's definitely something that I'm still learning. I'm not perfect, but um, it's helped me because it's shown me, I think, like how broken and how insecure wow. I was. Um, and just the fact that it's almost like... Um, like, you know that game Jenga? Like, mm -hmm. if you were to take, like, the building blocks off, right, and God is just, like, helping me rebuild it. So I, it's it's now allowing me to see people in a different way. Mm. Um, see people, I'm trying to see people more the way Jesus does. So, yeah. yeah, it's been helpful. Yeah, but the power of having a theological, <clears throat> a theological framework for doing that, mm -hmm. or else where are you getting, like, where is that source that's that's informing your conscience like no I don't want to see that person that way I want to see that person this way right. and how that actually can begin to bridge and, and mend relationships um here at one shot church we our desire is to be a multi-ethnic uh multicultural multi-generational church um and because that's what God desires that's not what we desire necessarily that's God's dream but I, we believe, as followers of Jesus, the only way we can effectively do that is to have a theological framework uh, that will inform what we think, and what we think will ultimately inform how we behave and what we do, and then that will ultimately inform what we create, what we produce, and this is what we've been defining culture to be. Uh, Brother Sonny, uh, I want to ask you a, 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 a question um, real quick. How can we resist uh first of all let me ask you this question is culture bad depends expound <clears throat> um there is a there's a way to be lost in culture that is a bad thing mm -hmm. that that is a detrimental thing to your growth that can stunt your growth that can um backtrack your go growth so there's a way to be lost in culture that might be bad for you. Mm -hmm. um, but is culture bad? Uh, Christ culture isn't bad. I know that's cheating, but mm -hmm. I will say that. Yeah. <laughs> I will say that. But the the culture of the world it has, like, there's, because you can almost look at anything as culture. And I remember um, there, was a, there was a place at which, like, um, Jesus was looking at, uh, well, encountered a, a man, and he said, um, uh, sh it was a question of money, right? Like uh, the, and he gave him the coin, and he said, uh, who's whose face is on that coin? Jesus is saying mm -hmm. this to the guy, and he says, oh, that's Caesar. He says, what belongs to Caesar, you give to him. 
but my concern is with you. you what you belongs to the father, you give to the father, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's like you you what we belong our our concern should be with Christ because he's our creator, right? Mm-hmm. And so like are there things in the world that we have to do? Yeah, man, I got to have I got to have a job, you right. know what I'm saying? I got to uh, interact with people. I love music, mm-hmm. so I listen to all types of music. Yeah. So um, I'm not just listening to Lecrae and Hill song. You feel me? So mm-hmm. that's me. But I'm not getting mm-hmm. lost in that. You feel me? Right, right. I'm not getting lost in the idea of like, oh, I have to look like the world. I have to act like the world. See, like that idea of culture, mm-hmm. the depth of culture, where it's like, who I am is not defined by the world, but it's defined by my creator. Mm-hmm. And like that kind of speaks to the point I wanted to make about what Yvette was saying earlier, mm-hmm. where it's like in theology, in the Bible, you get to see the character, the who, the nature of Christ. Mm-hmm. And why is that important? Because that is directly like influenced. That's, that's a direct influence on my identity. Mm-hmm. So if I'm out in the world seeking my identity if i'm in culture so this is where culture gets bad per se because if i'm looking for my identity inside culture the culture of the world then i'm lost i'm lost in the sauce as they say let me let me really because i think what you just said was really good if if we lose the the essentially what i heard you say is if christ isn't in the center of the culture then it, it it will always have a tendency, or not tendency, but it it will inevitably lean towards destruction. It, it will lean towards evil. Yeah. Okay. That's that's. I think people need to know that because we're not Jesus people, or we're not Christ centered. Just just because it's a religious fad, we really do believe that if Christ is not involved in what's going on in our lives, inevitably. Those things, uh, those people, those relationships, those opportunities have a way have have an opportunity to go wayward. Absolutely, yeah. And it's an issue of identity. Mm. Like I said, looking for my identity in the world was first of all. Let me say my issue. It was I had to deal with that. I had to come to terms with the fact that a lot of my attachment, a lot of my uh, identity seeking per se, yeah, was attached to the world. And I was trying to look for my identity in my uh, in my blackness, in my like oromoness, in my uh, what does the world say a man has to be, mm-hmm. and I have to be that way. And uh, that seems to be so prevalent right now. Yeah, it 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 because as human beings, we many of us who believe in Christ, many of us who believe in God, that there is a Creator God. We find a sense of solace in the fact that we come from some someone mm-hmm. other than our parents and their parents' parents and their parents' parents, mm-hmm. right? Because if your identity is found in your blackness, if your identity is found in your whiteness or or in um, your country, you know, you know, there's a lot of guys I'm connected to, like the the American flag in 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 the country of America has almost. It's it's almost become worship and idolatry, like like hey bro you 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 really think that there's going to be an American I'm a, I'm an American and I, and I love this country but do you really think there's going to be an American flag waving in heaven No there's not going to you know it's 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 so if we if we can tend to elevate these things and these ideals above Christ and He is not the center of it. We, we will find ourselves in idolatry. We will find ourselves in situations that will be harmful to us and not just us, but as what we can see, one another. Because now I got to divide with you over what? How, how deep is it? How important? There's only one thing I really want to divide with people over, and that is, hey, I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not forcing him upon you. I'm not saying we have to end our relationship because of Jesus, but I worship Christ and Christ alone. It's just like Daniel when Daniel refused to worship or to petition the king and 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 he was thrown in the lion's den. 
because of that. Or or, or uh, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, because they refused to bow down and worship the, the, the golden image, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. It's just like, hey, but they lived in Babylon. They were Jewish exiles living in a Babylonian society, forced uh, to, to have Babylonian names, forced to learn the Babylonian culture, the Babylonian language. But yet there was something about them that refused to go past the line of, hey, I'm in this culture, but I will not worship what you desire for me to worship. I will not become ultimately who you desire for me to become. I will be who God has called me to be, even if it dep even if my life depends upon it. And I, I'm so inspired by the book of Daniel. And I have one last question. Um, really, I want to make this statement, and then I'll, I'll throw this question at you guys. Um, the reason why we've been doing this, this series called Christ Over Culture is because Christ is a messianic term. Christ means Messiah. Messiah simply means anointed one. This is this is the individual that that God prophesied about in Genesis chapter three uh, when he spoke to Satan. And he said that I'm going to put enmity. I'm going to put division between the seed of the woman and and he is going to to crush your head, speaking about Satan, right? So, and then we see Isaiah and Jeremiah and all these major prophets and minor prophets prophesy about this coming Messiah who's gonna rule and he's gonna reign and he's gonna usher in God's kingdom. The reason why we've been doing this series is because I want Christians to understand this. The kingdom of God is real. The kingdom of God has a king and he is Jesus the Christ, Jesus, the anointed one, and his kingdom has a culture. And, and, and although, yes, we live in this earth and this earth has a culture and some of the culture is not inherently bad. But when we begin to remove Christ and reject Christ in this culture, absolutely, we will see bad things happen. But what God has called you and I to do, he's called us to be kingdom builders. He wants to bring his kingdom, his heavenly culture here on earth. But how can he do that if we've elevated culture, whatever cultural context we come from, if we've elevated culture to a place far above Christ? How can the kingdom of God be advanced in, in, in the earth? You wanted to say Yeah, I do have something to say on that, which is like understanding, going back to the verse in Colossians, such as Set your mind on things that are above and understanding that, um, like earlier, I used the, that verse to kind of explain how me understanding my position, understanding that I am, there's something higher than me, will one, humble me, uh, and two, bring me to a place where I'm searching and seeing that what I'm doing, what I'm doing, what I have chosen to do on this earth is not what's going to, you know, get me right yeah. going forward, uh, to say right but then using that same verse and looking at it from the perspective of set your mind on things that are above there is something that is higher than anything that we can see touch feel or even experience on this earth right and so knowing that no culture is not the highest whatever you have taken and put in above put above like jesus is not it's out of place it's out of position not because only because of like you putting that thing there, but also that you have like demoted, um, not, yeah, you have demoted, uh, the person of Christ, the, the person of Jesus, who he is. And it, that's why I, I, going back to the idea of theology, it's understanding the character, who, the who, the who of the Father, right? The who of who God is and, and knowing that he is above all. Then when you when you have positioned him in the right place, it doesn't matter what you do. Nobody can ever achieve per, uh, perfection, but mm -hmm. the knowing, knowing where his position is, where his real position is, sets you to a place where you're like you're constantly chasing after that, mm -hmm. like constantly chasing after what is the most important thing in your life. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Final thoughts on that? Um, I was just gonna. I was thinking like the world's culture, like kind of to send you's point is like. The world culture is smoke and mirrors, right? But it's also a really weak foundation. And I feel like because it's so weak, it's always changing. Why do you think it's weak? 
I think it's weak because people make up culture. So mm. we as humans, we're imperfect anyway. So our culture is not going to be perfect anyway. Mm. Um, but even as culture like changes, um, I think it leaves people feeling empty and where you might have agreed on one point now it's just like you don't understand or you don't agree anymore um and i think that kind of leads people to kind of like what Senyu is saying like searching for something else outside of culture that's good yeah i think uh i think i definitely uh feel like uh, obviously uh, if you reject christ or if you haven't invited christ into your life what else are you clinging to you know, what else is stable where the Bible says that, like, Christ is the unmovable anchor. He is the unmovable mountain. Nothing moves him. Nothing shakes him. He is the foundation that will that will forever be established for eternity. So that means that if we're building our lives on anything other than Christ, we're essentially building our lives on instability. We're building our lives on insecurity. We're building our lives on something that will never give us a holistic peace and trust and confidence. Um, Sonny, do you have any th closing thoughts um, before I share the scripture with the fo uh, with the folks? Do you have any closing thoughts? Yeah, definitely. I think one thing to be um, said as an encouragement uh, in in all of this is knowing that um, in his might, in his position, like we I just said, like like him being at the top of all things and all things falling under him, he still desires to be closer to us. So he mm. is the one that reached out. He is the one, um, even the the cross is an image of God reaching out to us. Yeah. Um, his death on the cross is him reaching out and saving us, like literally from the grasp of uh, like death and sin, right? Mm. Um, all all God's interactions with us, that's what the gospel is. Yeah. It's him reaching out. So the encouragement is that, dude, like, for me, I had to come to a place where I was like, man, he's constantly chasing after me. And it's just a, it's a, it's a mindset of me saying, hey, let me fix my mind. Mm. Let me fix my mind on this person who's constantly, it's like that, it's like that person that constantly texts you and is like, hey, man, what's up? And you're like, bro, I'm not really trying to, you know, like, Talk to this person. I feel like somebody needs to hear that, what you just said. Because many times, especially, I don't know why we why this is a cultural thing in the church, but we feel like God has somehow given up on us. Mm. Or God will, like, God, God is, God really isn't um, chasing after us. Can you speak to that person real quick? For sure. And just encourage them, like, hey, mm. what, what you think you have done mm. is not... Uh, more powerful than the grace of God reaching out to you. Absolutely, I think like even if you look at the the uh, my my shameless plug, uh, my sermon from last week is about uh, hey, like even the the sin of the of Adam didn't overtake or wasn't greater than the saving power of Christ and what mm. Christ did on the cross, right? And so think about it, like what uh, what Adam did. First of all, was treason to God, right? And then he was cast out, and he cursed the rest of us forever. Um, I have my own quarrels with Adam, but we don't got to get into that now. But in the same way, right? So, like, this high treason was not greater than what Christ did on the cross. And the same thing, like, for everybody out there, even for me, for all of us that are here, like, that is the same grace. That is the same uh, mercy that is the same saving power that is afforded to us and that is the same power that is like i said chasing after us and it's so encouraging like because that's what saved my life that's what saved everybody's life actually but that's what saved my life for sure and it's like nothing that you have done nothing that you will do is greater than jesus saving power jesus mercy and grace so like that is the encouragement for me, and that is the encouragement for everybody else, that we are never beyond saving when it comes to Jesus. And that's good. And that, and that that is so true. And uh, I want to close this uh, real quick. There's so much we could share. Uh, there's so much that we didn't get into. Uh, what we've been doing, though, as a community is we have B groups, and we actually have been gathering in homes 
and after the sermon is played or or uh, in B groups, when we revisit the sermon, we have times where we talk like we talked a lot about abortion um, a couple weeks back. And we had a great conversation about that. And a lot of us were challenged. A lot of us, our minds were opened and in and, and the uh, the heart that we felt was how do we love on our community better? How do we love and display love in our community and 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 not just be uh, 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 voting booth warriors, you know what I mean? Because there's people who will vote yeah. against things, but they won't do anything. They won't get into the community. They won't love in the community. They won't put their money where their mouth is or their time where their, you know, where their talk is. And so, um, so yeah, we, we want to create these at these atmospheres, these environments where we can have greater conversation because we can't talk about it all in this in this time here. But I wanted to share this one final scripture with you guys. As, guys, as we were talking, the scripture just came upon my heart and I just, I sensed that, man, listen, our world, if you haven't noticed, the fabric of it is falling apart. It is not strong. It is not durable. It is failing us. Um, and many of us, salva uh, our salvation has become our democracy. For many of us, our salvation looks like red, white, red, white, and blue, and some stars. And and guys, I, I like I said, I love this country. But what I want you all to understand this is this world is failing us. This world is fallen. It will never ever come to this euphoric. Uh, uh, utopia that we all long for it to be the only way it will become what our hearts long for it to be is when the Christ the king the true king the good ruler the righteous and just ruler when he comes to the earth and he sets his throne right here on this earth the Bible says that 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 the the lion shall lay down with the lamb there shall be no more need for war. There shall be no more need for, for violence. There will be peace on earth. And, and I want to share this verse because um, I just feel this sense of reverence. And uh, I think it would encourage you. It's Psalm 33, verse 6. Um, and, and David says this. He says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Everything that we can see, our universe, everything, our solar systems, as unique as it is, Everything, the heavens were made by the word of the Lord and by the breath of his mouth, all their host, all of the angelic beings, all of the stars, all of the planets, everything has has come about by the breath of his mouth. And it says in verse seven, he gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps into storehouses. All of the water finds its place here on earth, uh, underneath the earth. Many geologists have, have discovered that. And he's in verse eight. I love this. It says, let all the earth, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the earth be in awe of the Lord, be in reverence of the Lord. And he says, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Guys, I want to encourage you. The God that we serve is all powerful, almighty, all knowing, and all loving. And I pray that during this season, um, as there will be much joy, um, much happiness, there will also be much sorrow, much grief because of what's taking place in our world right now. But I want to encourage your heart to let you know this the God that created the universe with ease, the breath of his mouth, the word of his mouth, loves you, cares for you, has shed his blood for you. No matter what we are experiencing in this earth right now, it will never bring you the peace that knowing Christ can bring you. It will never bring you the peace that standing in awe of the God who created everything we can see can bring you. So guys, I wanna encourage you, um, God is good. And Jesus is coming back. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you feel yeah, me? Yeah, what you want me to say all the time. All, all the, the time, cuz. So, uh, so, man, yeah, be encouraged. We love you guys. Uh, 
we want to say happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Um, happy happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. I know. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I met, I stole your thunder. Go ahead. <laughs> happy Thanksgiving. Notice how she squints her eyes and she's just like, oh, man, Yvette, Yvette. This is my little sister, if y'all haven't known that. But, uh, man, happy Thanksgiving to you guys. Eat good. Uh, uh, the Cowboys suck. Stretch your hands and pray for them because we need the Lord. Amen. Salvation. We need Target salvation uh, to the Cowboys. Who's your team, by the way? Some off-brand team? Uh, the Chargers suck, too, so I can't even talk. Oh, no. The, Charger, the Chargers. At, okay, guys. We're done. We're done talking about football. We love y'all. It's uh, Sunny. one shot. One shot, baby. 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 All right. Shut